Technical Directing is a 30-month postgraduate program for students specialized in computer science or alike subjects. TDs focus on technically challenging aspects of media productions, they engage in research and development, and they learn how to operate complex hardware like motion capture, camera tracking, or large-scale LED technology for in-camera visual effects. Let's have a look at the latest TD reel. Let me give you a few more informations about the technical directing curriculum. So we are running continuous workshops by staff and industry professionals. Um, they start with basic courses like math for TDs and an introduction to object-oriented programming followed by practical workshops on C++, C Sharp and Python. And of course, um, we are providing a lot of workshops and seminars that are dedicated to learning and mastering software packages. And at Film Academy, we have pretty much all software um, that's on the market. Um, Film Academy relies on state-of-the-art studios and professional film equipment. That includes XR technology with the latest VR and AR devices. Now, the whole 30 months are divided into five semesters and I quickly would like to run you through these semesters so you understand what it is that technical director students do and learn here. So in the first semester, um, uh, their work is dedicated to the Any Film and Any Play project. That's where TDs become an active team member in creating a film and interactive experience based on the same story and visual world. The second semester is focused intensively on FMX. And later in the semester, we offer various workshops that aim at providing a good overview of the technological potential for media productions. That includes our virtual filmmaking workshop and motion capture and camera tracking technology. The third semester is where technical directing students engage as lead TDs in large projects. Usually, they set their focus to topics like pipeline and tool development, lighting and shading, rigging, or effects work. In the third year, they also start to develop their own ideas for research projects. The fourth semester continues with uh, the TDs in their lead role, uh, involved in, in one or maybe multiple projects, that depends. And uh, in the fourth year, the students also start to implement their research, one of their research idea, and start evaluating that in real production scenarios. 
The fifth semester is where all of this work is, is finalized, including publication of the research activity. Now let's take a look at two of our um, technical directing students from the second year. We'll have Pascal Schober and Justus Schmidt. Hi, I'm Justus and currently I'm studying technical directing in the second year. So let me start by telling you a bit about myself. Um, who am I? Um, after I finished school in 2013, I started working at the uh, little design company called Design for Real in Munich which at that time focused heavily on virtual reality productions. And this is where I gained my first work experience in 3D design and programming. Um, and then in 2015, I began studying animation and game at Hochschule Darmstadt. Uh, this course of studies focuses on the whole animation game pipeline, including design, programming, tech art. And over the three years that I've been there, I, I really learned a lot and gained a lot of experience in animated movie productions. But I also developed a very strong interest towards the more technical bits and pieces like pipelining, rigging, rendering, and tools to ease up the whole process. Um, after I got my bachelor's degree, however, I wanted to focus and learn more about these technical things. So the uh, technical direction course at Film Academy was uh, the obvious choice. Uh, for me, it's the perfect combination that allows me to concentrate on improving my technical skills. I've got lots of time to develop tools rig systems, etc., and learn new software packages while also working and improving on my creative skill set as well, like, for example, doing shading and lighting. So what am I doing at Film Academy? Uh, let me give you guys a quick rundown of the project that I've been involved in uh, in the last year. Uh, first, off, first off, we have Climax. Um, a year ago when COVID hit, I started working on that diploma project, or Climax in German. Um, as a pipeline lighting and compositing DD. Uh, the whole project is designed as a one-shot film, which made the pipeline system extra complex. And it was also for me the first time working with Odini, which was very, very much fun, but uh, yet very challenging in the beginning. And during my time at the project, uh, which I'm still working on, by the way, I was uh, also responsible for shading, some simulation, overall problem solving. And I also developed a fascination for lighting, especially in such tough and artistic environments. Um, what you can see here is still work in progress, but I'm sure you can get an idea of how it's going to look like. In parallel to that, I also worked on several projects uh, with rigging. Previously, I, I had only experience with rigging in Maya, but I, I got the chance to try out different software packages as well. So I rigged a fairly complex character in Houdini, uh, which you can see here. And uh, this is the final result. It confronted me with a lot of challenges, uh, especially in regard to performance and efficiency. The visual node system of Houdini made the setup of a lot of technical mechanics very, very easy and intuitive, yet uh, several objectives needed custom solutions. I, for example, developed my own blend shape system as the ship Houdini blend shape node would simply not support all the features that were needed for that rig, like masking regions, for example. Tasks like skin wetting, however, became really hard, since uh, the tools were not yet as nice to handle as I'd hoped. And I then ended up using a system of, of different skin weight approaches for the, for the different body regions, whatever fit best, um, which then resulted in larger file sizes and, sadly, less performance. It was very tricky to get the performance to an animatable level. Uh, during that time, I was also in permanent contact to the animator, which uh, really helped a lot in, in solving problems and getting immediate feedback. For other projects, I also helped by reading a few characters in Blender. Uh, Blender, again, has a, a very much different approach uh, to rigging as uh, what I previously known. Um, but it was a lot of fun getting into these different concepts and uh, it also helped to get a more diverse understanding of what it takes to, to read a character. Um, and at the moment, I'm also working on my diploma project, uh, which is called Town Square Hall. Uh, it's going to be a 3D short produced in Maya. And for that, I'm currently developing the pipeline 
And this is where I really noticed my previous pipeline work and tools work on Climax. Um, I really noticed that I, I really improved a lot. Um, my diploma project will also profit from a research project, which I'm going to talk about now. The TD course of studies also includes doing a research project. Um, my research project is once again focusing on rigging. I'm building an auto rigger for faces, which will be heavily inspired by the rigs in the Blue Sky movie Peanuts. And in that movie, they tried to mimic the 2D characters of the Peanuts or Charlie Brown franchise in 3D, which resulted in a face rig that changes, changes its shape based on the camera's perspective. Um, so what you can see here is our character, not to get you confused, it's not, a, not the Peanuts one. And as you can see, the nose, for example, always stays at the, ed at the edge of the mesh. Also, the whole uh, head slides on top of the skull mesh in order to get the expressions and blend shapes interpolated based on the head's shape and not in a linear fashion as usual. Um, this skull mesh gets generated using my tool, um, including all the corresponding blend shapes. Here you can see the, the skull on the, on the right and the final driven skin with the eyes attached on the left. And my Otterigger will be used in the upcoming Diploma project, which makes working on it extra cool since I'm working on real, on real characters and I get direct help uh, and advice from animators. And now I'm gonna give you a quick demonstration on how far I've come so far by showing you my prototype. So here we are in Maya. As you can see, we have several meshes of the same character uh, for the different perspectives. Also, we have uh, the eyes and the nose. And this is the prototype. And as you can see, you can simply drag and drop the objects into each perspective view. But when that's not enough for you, uh, you can also set up a, a custom matrix and drag and drop the objects there. Um, I'm just gonna fast forward a bit. And uh, we also, of course, need the camera as the movement uh, is camera, camera dependent. And we need a base mesh as well, uh, which is the perspective where the eyes and the nose stick onto. Of course, we would like to generate a skull and we would like to have smooth topology. This takes a little longer, but uh, we can manage that. Um, then we assign the eyes and here you can really see that uh, the interface is not quite done yet. <laughs> and uh, when we click on generate, um, we get the face rig. Um, and under the hood, apart from generating the skull, it mostly uh, generates a bunch of mel expressions based on uh, on your input, um, which then interpolates between the different shapes based on the uh, based on the camera. Um, so yeah, that's been it. Thank you guys so much for listening, and uh, goodbye. Hey, I'm Pascal. I'm currently studying technical directing in the second year. And now I will tell you who I am and how I did get here. I started as CG generalist in a small company doing commercials. There I gained a lot of experience in all the different departments involved in creating animation and VFX. Also I noticed some things that could be improved to speed up the workflow. So I got into scripting and started automating some things. While still working as a 3D artist I wrote my first tools. Two years later, I applied for Film Academy and started studying animation there. I realized I'm more into the technical part and not the creative. I don't want to develop the projects. I want to make them possible and improve on existing workflows. So I switched to technical directing after second year. So what am I doing at Film Academy? The first semester in TD studies is dedicated to any trailer, any play where a group of five to six people develop an IP and create a short trailer and game or interactive experience for the world. In my case, we developed the world of Rusty Halls, an old people's home where we showed three different characters struggling with their problems in the trailer. For the interactive part, we built a game where you can play as one of the characters and go around in the old people's home. But there was a challenge. The character you are playing is an old Roomba, 
which lost one of its wheels. So it only turns in circles. Also, you don't just get a controller to control him. We designed an installation where you have to spin a wheel in order to help the Roomba in the game to get some speed. More speed leads to larger circles and this way you can guide him through the endless rooms of the old people's home. As a technical director, I was responsible for the pipeline in general. For the trailer part, I created several tools to make the life of all the artists easier. Starting with a launcher to make sure all the artists do have the same version, environments and color management settings. To a manager where artists quickly can browse through all the assets, shots and open them in the according software as well as save versions and publish them. I also did write some scripts for Maya to automatically generate play blasts, set up render settings and add custom AOVs. Also I integrated the Arnold Denoiser into Nuke. I did lighting and rendering optimizations and created a pipeline to prepare the renders for compositing by splitting them and denoising them. For the play part, I helped on getting a usable input for the wheel you can spin on the installation and wrote a player controller for the Roomba. Also, I created an infinite level with endless rooms and a system to dynamically fill these rooms with different props. Another project I worked on is the most boring granny in the whole world. The whole project is supposed to have a miniature feel to it. To create the needed realism, some assets were built and then photo scanned, which created a good baseline for the quality of the digital assets. On this project, I did a lot of shading and look dev to get all of the props to the right feel. But the biggest challenge were the character's skin shaders. They required a mix of miniature decals like fingerprints and a soft skin which in itself would not fit to the other miniature assets, thus making it very hard to get a balance between a stiff detailed texture and a soft skin material. To create it, I used a combination of displacement and code layers to add the detail on defined parts of the character's faces while keeping a decent amount of subsurface scattering and make them feel more realistic. I also created rigs for some props and did a lot of simulations for a blanket. Another project I'm working on is The Giant and the Seed, which is the story of a character who discovers what lies beyond the borders of her protected paradise-like home. The project has a very specific art style which required most of the assets to be painted in Photoshop. But there are also 3D characters, so early on, Sarah, the director of the project, approached me and asked how we can make that work. Some weeks later I presented her a little tool which allows artists to import layers of Photoshop files into Blender and convert them to geometry with some depth. The layers are projected on geometry which bends around at the edges to give it a 3D look, especially when interacting with lights. In the next weeks I refined the basic concept and added more controls for the mesh generation, resolution and some other options to give the artist more control over the final mesh. Also, updating all the textures is now handled by just one button, since some of the assets will be colorized later on. Since this point, the tool is used in production and helps to generate beautiful scenes. The project is realized in Blender with Eevee as main render engine, although cycles might be used in some special cases. I decided to create a small pipeline to make some steps easier. At that point, I realized that unfortunately, we could not use the render farm of Animations Institute since Royal Render didn't support rendering EV at that time. Therefore, I started working on my own solution, which ended up to be a handy small render manager for Blender. Since everybody is working from home, the render manager needs to be able to work on all our workstations at home, as well as on the workstations at Animations Institute. Since we had a working setup to access the project share at Animations Institute via Nextcloud and sync it to our home workstations, I decided to build it around this Nextcloud sync as a file-based application without a dedicated server for handling the jobs and tasks. If you start the render manager on multiple clients, it will automatically assign one client as a server. It has all the basic features like priorities, previews, logs and so on, but some are more advanced. For example, it will lock the system resources used for each job and work out if it could start another instance of the same job, which is often the case with small EV renders, since the only thing they really need is VRAM. It also locks the time to open the files and render the frames and automatically adjusts how many frames are rendered without reopening the same file. 
Another helpful thing is the idle detection, which only starts renders if the user is not at his workstations and abots them if the user is back. Also, it just starts little jobs like animation previews, which won't need a lot of system resources and can be rendered without impacting the user. One major part of studies other than the project is the scientific research project. VTDs can decide to work on a specific topic related to some papers or open source projects. In my case, I decided to do a smart library with auto-labeling, which is a standalone application I want to create. It's basically a library with different assets like 3D models, materials, HDIs, textures, and so on, from which you can export all of the contents into different DCCs like Maya, Houdini, and Nuke. Therefore, I want to work with image recognition and object detection on the imported assets and automatically create all the texts required for them to be found in the library. Unfortunately, I don't have much to show here, since everything is still in early development. I started working on a neural network for tagging HDRIs based on different parameters like indoor or outdoor, day-night, ambient or directional light. To train it, I had to label some HDRIs, so I also created a little tool for that. Later, the HDRIs can be found either by text generated through object detection or through the parameters of the HDRIs I just mentioned, which will be estimated by the neural network on the import of the new HDRI. Currently, I'm working on improving the detection and building a solid framework so I can easily expand the tool in the future. After that, I will implement materials, textures, and 3D models with according auto-tagging features into the library. I'm going to develop the complete tool within the next few months and really looking forward for its use at the Animation Institute in different projects. For now, that's all. So thank you for listening and goodbye. Hello, I'm Tonio Freitag. I'm an R&D artist and a VFX lecturer here at the Animationsinstitut. And I've had the pleasure of supporting our set extension workshop for the last five years. In this interdisciplinary workshop, we bring together students from cinematography, production design, and visual effects animation to create a live action short film enhanced by visual effects. The goal of this workshop is for the students to run through a complete visual effects production from start to finish on a manageable scale. The team has to come up with its own story, write their own script, create concepts, and design everything their movie needs. Once the script is written and the concepts are finished, the production designers immediately start building the set, building props, working on costumes, and so on, while the visual effects students are joined by the cinematographers in creating storyboards, animatics, and previs. When this is done, there is usually one day of shooting in front of green screen or blue screen, during which we try to emphasize the shared responsibility of the different departments. After the shoot, there's the brief post-production phase of just a few weeks, during which the VFX students bring everything together and polish the film as much as possible. Here to talk about the 2019 project is the team of the movie Sprout, which was finished just before Corona started. Hello. My name is Isabella Braun. Together with Jay and Chen, I produced the Set Extension Workshop 2019 of Film Academy School. The intention of this workshop is that the students of the camera, the production design, and VFX department learn how to work together. I'm here to present you our VFX team of our project Sprout. In the position of director Niklas Wolf, in the position of supervisor Harald Dieterichs, in the position of our concept design and the digital and live action production design coordination, Elina Eskelinen. In the position of our technical director and responsible for a beautiful pipeline, Paul Golter. And last but not least, Tom Tolle, who was in charge of our previous, the communication with the camera department, head of modeling and procedural set dressing. Now you can follow our team guiding you through the process. Thank you. Hi there. As Bella already mentioned, I got the chance to direct the film that we created as part of the workshop. I will quickly summarize the story for you, and then we will show you our visual effects breakdown. 
Our film Sprout tells the story of a young woman who has to survive in the deadly ruins of humanity. The air has become unbreathable and the only way for her to survive is to live in symbiosis with a little plant. But she has one dream. She wants to reach the surface of the earth where she hopes to find a new place to live. A paradise with fresh, breathable air. We follow her on this journey that will push both her and her plant to the absolute limits. Now we will show you our visual effects breakdown. Have fun! Hope you enjoyed it. One of the main goals of the set extension workshop is to create a set in the studio and digitally extend it to sell the illusion of a bigger world. We wanted to take that a step further, so we built multiple smaller sets with modular parts instead of one big stage. This way we could tell a journey through a huge environment all within the bounds of the studio. We had to work at a very fast pace on this project. From the first day where we met most of the team members for the first time to the day of our shoot, we had just one month. Thankfully, we had a great team of cinematography, production design and animation students. Collaborating with the other departments was a great experience. We all tried to help each other out as much as we could and learned a lot about each other's workflows in the process. One of the areas where both the cinematography and animation students tried something new together was the virtual production of the VFX shots. Our VFX supervisor Harry will tell you more about that now. For virtual production of the set extension, we decided not to use the Ancam system, but rather use pre existing hardware solutions like HTC Vive trackers and Blackmagic 18 video mixing to maintain low level complexity with minimum effort and avoid calibration time with the outside in tracking of the Lighthouse technology. We used Unity Engine with the tracking plugin offered by SteamVR and our previous assets plus some minor scripts for simple adjustments and recording. 
It was solidly serving for the collaboration with the camera department so that they could see the mixed signal in the camera viewfinder via SDI to frame the best possible shots. Even though we considered to use the onset recorded FBX files of camera movement to support the match move process in thin eyes, jitter and lack of precision made the tracks useless for post-production. Plus the fact that the hectic and crowded shooting environment prevented a reliable but required line of sight makes the usage of the inside out tracking solutions, like for example the Ankin system, mandatory for further production. I will now hand over to Tom, who will go briefly through the previous process. Hi, my name is Tom, and I was responsible to create a previous and a techvis, which is very important to determine what we can do on set and what do we have to do in post production. But in the middle of the process, suddenly people came to me from other departments and asked, yeah, can we change that? Can we put the set piece here in? Can we do this color here? And it sort of became a communication device between the department because um, everyone just put their work in it and everyone could just instantly see, ah, that is our plan. That is what we want to do. And now to the art director, Alina. Hi. The concepts and environment design were done in close collaboration with the production design team. In tandem with the story development, the art department worked on different iterations of the visuals for the main shots and material schemes, as well as progression maps for lighting and color. We divided into two main design groups, one dedicated to character design and props, and another one for word design and sets. Scene sketch was a great tool to keep track of our progress and gathering feedback from the different departments to ensure that we kept all designs consistent across the board. Before the shootings, we concentrated in, in creating a cohesive word design and physical set design in order to have a smooth integration of the two later in the post-production phase. To, to achieve that, we iterated different uh, designs using rough 3D models of the structure to test out the scale of our 3D environment and paper models to test out the studio construction before moving to actual construction drawings. The same rough model of the structure then being used for both previous and later visual production. Only after the shooting, we then switch gears to focus in designing individual 3D assets and details of our siege environment. And next time, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we put this together with procedural set dressing. We started by blocking the environment in Blender, but we knew instantly we couldn't fill all this empty space by hand. So I did a few procedural systems in Houdini to fill everything with layers, with pipes, with ladders and so on and I took a long time dress everything put everything on places where it is believable and created this path where she basically climbed up to the top and now to Paul with the pipeline so in our environment we had over 60 assets that needed to be quickly populated in our Houdini pipeline and because we wanted to have early visual feedback it meant for us working with lots of iteration and because of that, we needed to find a workflow to quickly identify each asset in our scene and be able to update them. And yeah, for those reasons, I developed a couple of tools to solve those problems. The Asset Loader HDA is a tool that enables us to browse our folder structure in Houdini and import assets with an already pre-built node tree out of the box. We have many useful options and settings, for example, loading an animation cache, to export a version of our asset, you can use the next tool, the Asset Saver. You simply plug in your subnet and it recognizes the asset and where it has to be saved. You specify what asset type you want to publish and hit the export button. It will warn you if you would override a previous version. And the last tool I want to show is the Asset Updater. It can scan your scene and show you a list of imported assets. And with one click of a button, you can update all outdated HDAs to the latest version. Yeah, so this was a quick look behind the scenes of our pipeline and Bella will have the last word. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed our talk and I wish you a nice day. Bye bye. Our previous set extension workshops always used blue screen or green screen 
And while they did also use some pre-production tools, um, for example, for onset previs, they mainly worked in traditional visual effects and post-production pipelines. For last year's workshop, a lot of things changed. First, of course, was the corona pandemic, which had a huge impact on every meeting, every discussion, and also, of course, on the shoot, which um, took place under heavy restrictions and rules, but worked out very well in the end. The second big difference was the use of a 7 by 4 meter LED wall, which was never done before at the Film Academy. And as you might know, the use of LED tends to focus, to shift the focus of the production heavily towards the pre-production. That means that all the assets have to be, the digital assets have to be finished before the shooting and they have to match whatever the production designers built perfectly. On the plus side, it speeds up the post-production process because you already have a lot of scenes that don't need really real post-production anymore because they are already filmed uh, on set and also because you can use the assets that you created before the shoot in post-production. Here to talk about their experience with this technology is the team of High Score Heaven, which was last year's set extension workshop. everyone, welcome to our presentation. My name is Jian Chen and I'm the producer of the project High Score Heaven. This project is the final result of the set extension workshop where the students at Animations Institute in second year get the opportunity to work with production design students and camera students intensively for three months to make a short film. This year, we focus clearly on the integration of technical innovation, and we are the first generation to work with a LED wall on set instead of green screen in this workshop. Now, our director Dominic Gihot will tell you more about the story and the concept of the project. Hello, my name is Dominic Giraud, and I was the director of High Score Heaven. Making this project become real was a very difficult task in times of a global pandemic. We were lucky enough to be able to shoot and complete most of a film before the second wave and a new lockdown forced us into home office. We also had a lot of restrictions concerning our well-being. We could only shoot with a small crew on set and needed to carefully plan everything ahead, but without any guarantee that our plans would actually be implemented. Creating a VFX-heavy project is hard enough under normal circumstances. But this time, it was made more difficult by the overall situation already mentioned and especially by the fact that we are dealing with a technology that was completely unknown to us. The production choice of using an LED wall put us through many challenges and was demanding, but the experience was absolutely worth it and it was a great opportunity to be able to work with an LED wall. Finding the right story within the short pre-production phase we had was also a challenging task. What was special for this project was that in my role as director, I was given the task of creating a story from the get-go together with over a dozen other team members, making sure to bring together the wishes and ideas of all those involved into one vision. Thanks to everyone's creative suggestions, we were able to work out a story together which suited our narrative demands, but also, above all, addressed the strengths of the LED wall as much as possible. 
From the beginning, we had the idea of using vertical movement in a low-key scenario to be able to use the reflections on the set caused by the LED wall. We were forced to create a world small enough to run smoothly in Unreal, but also detailed enough so it would be giving the illusion of a breathing and living place. With all our passion, we worked hard on completing this project in time in a satisfactory manner making a film about shaping your own destiny because you decide what person you want to be and this is the person you are thereby destined to become. Working in this workshop as a director and as a VFX artist and composer was a unique experience and a formative time. I learned a lot and I'm very grateful for attending the set extension workshop. Now Caroline, our technical director will tell you about our technical workflow with Anri. Thank you. Hello, my name is Caroline Koilatz and I was the technical director of High Score Heaven. Since we could not use the ordinary VFX pipeline for a set extension workshop, we had to find new ways to use the LED technology and integrate it into a functioning workflow. Working with and in the Unreal Engine was a big factor. We used it during the shoot for the set extension on the LED wall, but also as our main render engine for post-production. Our workflow thus included many work steps that you would otherwise find in a typical game development pipeline. For the managing of our Unreal project, we used version control, specifically Git. The use of Git enabled us to merge our individual progress at the end of the day. Working with Unreal also means working with many binary files, such as the U assets. If you don't have a way to lock them, it can easily lead to merge conflicts. Due to their size, they should also be tracked with LFS in order to not use up unnecessary space in the repository. With more time on our hands, I would have loved to try out more of the Unreal integration for Git LFS file locking, or even other software like Subversion or Pairforce. But our game development workflow didn't end there. Due to the massive resolution of the LED wall on which the scene had to be displayed, we were forced to limit our poly count to the absolute minimum. That's why we chose to populate the scene with a lot of textures for the background and only very few detailed assets for the middle and foreground. Since we needed a lot of assets in a very short time to fill the world, we mainly worked with procedurally generated and tileable textures and low poly models that had a couple of slightly different versions. They were then also procedurally scattered to create the illusion of a diverse and lively environment. For the model of our main character, we also had to rely mostly on the textures and movement for realism since the mesh itself had to be very reduced. To reach that high level of realism in such a tight deadline, we made photos of our actress to generate the main mesh through photogrammetry in Agisoft Metashape. We then cleaned it and painted new texture information where it was needed. After shading, the rigged and animated model was then imported into Unreal and placed on the shelf. Now I want to pass the word on to Jasmine who will give us a closer look into the FX workflow in Unreal. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jasmine Betzen. I am studying interactive media and in this project I was the technical artist and LED wall operator amongst others. Unreal was the perfect tool for this project since it could be used in a variety of ways. We used it for world building, FX, rendering full CG shots and the LED panel control. With the blueprint editor and its intuitive node user interface, it is possible for artists to simplify world building tasks especially if they have little to no experience with code. However, I personally can work better with the classic written code, so I'll rather stick with that in the future. We use the blueprint editor for the construction of the double helix, the structure on the walls of the world, and the falling bookshelves. This tool made those tasks much easier since it was possible to move and scale these constructions with ease instead of dauntingly having to place every single element by hand. We built the full CG shots using the sequencer. The challenge we faced was to combine the different skill sets and tasks we had. But with that mastered shortly, the single hindrance left at this point was the camera control, which kept getting rotation errors.
Niagara was hard to pick up at first, but once you nail down how it works, you can make beautiful effects. In contrast to Cascade, it is more intuitive to pick up, in my opinion. There are not as many documentations on the internet for Niagara as with Cascade, but I believe that Niagara will become the go-to tool for everything related to FX in Unreal of Time, especially since it's also possible to combine it with blueprints. The biggest difficulty was controlling the different parameters that are influencing each other, especially with this limited space. The more effects we added, the more complex it got. So it was a challenge to keep an overview of the different parameters and how they influence each other. I was also faced with the excruciating incident of Unreal crashing and yes, Unreal crashed multiple times. However, I forgot to save the progress for quite some time and lost a bunch of it. There I realized how hard it is to recreate a visual effect, but looking back it made for a great learning experience. That was it for me. Next up, Vincent will be talking about virtual and post-production. Hello, my name is Vincent Maurer and I was the VFX supervisor for High Score Heaven. One of our biggest challenges was to make sure we actually could shoot the shots we wanted to shoot because of the limited size of the DD wall and the studio. We had closed feedback loops between camera department, production design and VFX to match virtual and real world. I decided to bring TechWiz and Previs into one Blender scene so we could seamlessly switch between them when creating the shots. Which meant that we had more flexibility on set and could get very creative on what shots we wanted to achieve in camera. But it also meant that we were not as flexible anymore in post. One interesting aspect about virtual production is the rapid development of the technology, which was also a hurdle. Some stuff is not very well documented and in beta. We had to carefully select our tools and make our own if necessary. I was in close contact with our DOP, so we had the tool set to create the best images possible. We needed on-set control over lighting, FX and color to match foreign background. In addition, it was also crucial to be able to save and reproduce our setups later. After some problems with Unreal's multi-user editing and the limited flexibility of Unreal's web control in 4.25, I decided to build our own custom solution in Open Sound Control. It was easily expandable with new controls in Unreal. I built custom UI in Open Stage Control, which could be accessed from multiple PCs and tablets and was able to load and save our setups. It fit all our needs, but because of the limited development time, it was also a bit clunky. We hit some additional challenges with motion blur and depth of field because LED walls actually are not completely like real life. Not having motion blur was not an option for us because our falling shelves just didn't look convincing without it. After a lot of searching, I found the console command to activate it. It should be used with care though, glitches in the mocap also mean glitches on the LED wall and in the footage after that. We also found a solution for the lack of depth of field a lens encoder which could control the virtual focus on the LED wall. It needs further testing though, sometimes the double blurring just doesn't look right. Concerning looking right, our post-production was actually quite fast, because we were able to create the images we wanted on set already. We had the realistic lighting and reflections of the wall, though I wish we had a full volume, and the mocap data for free camera tracks. But when there were problems, they were a lot harder to fix. We had some issues with artifacts and ghost images, which meant a lot of rotoscoping and cloning instead. In summary, LED walls are a great addition to the traditional workflow. It allows greater interaction between the departments and produces beautiful imagery. Although the workflows are not quite there yet and need a bit more refinement, and they are not the solution for everything. But the best thing about LED walls, they are a lot of fun. Thank you to the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg our lecturers and all the artists which made this production possible. And now, have fun with the VFX breakdown.
Let me wrap up this technical directing presentations with some final information in case you're interested in studying here at Film Academy. So the curriculum is in English and international students are highly welcome. We have applicants and uh, running students from South America, um, Africa, um, Asia and all over Europe. So this has been a, a great addition um, uh, in terms of diversity to Film Academy. There are no student fees for EU residents and uh, non-EU residents will have to cover a fee of 1500 euros per semester. The application deadline for courses starting in fall is May 15th, 2021. And you can obtain more information from our website. The short URL is technicaldirector.de.